Coming up tonight on YCN News, Manchester Center Vermont native Alex Diebold takes a bronze medal in the Olympic snowboard cross. A 32-year-old Cold Spring, New York man is being charged by police with negligent operation for driving 101 miles per hour in a 55 mile per hour zone. And a fire early Monday morning at the Sugarbush Resort in Warren, Vermont causes $2 million in damages. For more news, weather, and sports, it's time for YCN, your local view. Now, your daily digest of the Dartmouth Lake Sunapee region, Southern Vermont, and Windsor County. News, sports, weather, and all that is happening in our area. The news on YCN, your local view. Good evening and welcome to this Tuesday edition of YCN News. I'm Rose Spillman. Today's ongoing snowfall is the perfect weather for winter sports, but for Manchester Center Vermont native Alex Diebold, the weather in Sochi, Russia added to Diebold's challenge on the slopes. Diebold prevailed and took the bronze medal in the Olympic snowboard cross. The rainy weather created a drizzly event for Diebold and his competitors. Diebold's medal comes after strategic planning during the race itself. A Team USA press release says Diebold held on to his position in the race. When he spotted room in a corner move to pass other athletes, Diebold did so. His quick thinking under pressure paid off, as the medal attests. Four years ago, at the Winter Olympic Games in Vancouver, Diebold wasn't even part of the Olympic team. He was on the team's support staff, helping other athletes prepare to compete. After the race, Diebold said since 2010, he doubted himself and his professional direction. Yet Diebold stayed with snowboarding, his passion. Even after surgeries, he persisted. Today, he knows his efforts were worth the struggle. Diebold told interviewers that all he wanted to focus on was his own snowboarding. In border cross, the fastest guy doesn't necessarily always win. All that I could focus on was my own snowboarding, and it paid off. In other weather-related news, a 32-year-old Cold Spring, New York man is being charged by police with negligent operation for driving 101 miles per hour in a 55 mile per hour zone. Vermont State Police say Jay Philippi is scheduled to appear in Bennington County Superior Court on March 24th for speeding on Route 7 through Shaftesbury. Philippi drove a 2011 Jeep Cherokee on that day. Road conditions around 4.30 p.m. on Saturday were not ideal at this time. Snow and slush covered the road, police say. The Vermont State Police remind motorists to watch their speed and be mindful of the speed limit, especially in winter weather and conditions. When YCN News returns, we'll hear about the fire early Monday morning that caused $2 million in damages and the Cornish School District debate on changing to SB2. The YCN News continues in a moment. Welcome back to YCN News. I'm Rose Spillman. A fire early Monday morning at the Sugarbush Resort in Warren, Vermont caused $2 million in damages. No one was reported injured as a result of the fire, state police fire investigators report. Today, a fire safety investigator says the fire that damaged a 36 condominium unit has been ruled as not being suspicious in nature. The exact cause of the fire has been ruled undetermined, yet investigators say findings at the scene suggest a heating appliance in one of the condos may have led to the blaze. Fire safety investigator Paul Cerruti reports the fire at the Mountainside Driver Sugarbush Resort was first attacked by Warren, Vermont firefighters responding to a report of smoke in the building. The resort is a three-storied structure. Firefighters discovered upon their 2.30 a.m. arrival moderate smoke in two of the complex units on the building's second and third floors. All occupants were evacuated. One of the smoke-filled units erupted into flames. Cold temperatures and the lack of water supply hindered the firefighters' efforts, officials say. Mutual aid to the Warren Fire Department came from Waterbury, Waitsfield, Moortown, Stowe, and Berlin Fire Departments. The fire damaged every unit, say fire investigators. Turning to New Hampshire, it remains to be seen if Cornish residents registered to vote will approve changing how the town's school district meeting is held in the future. 
a petition drive by Alicia Simino to have voters on March 8th approve changing to a two-day session received lukewarm support on Monday night. Most residents attending Monday night's Cornish School Board meeting said they prefer to keep the format as it is now. That would be to have one day where voters can debate and amend from the floor or during the actual meeting the proposed K-8 through school budget. Simino's petition calls for changing the meeting format to an SB2 town. A Senate Bill 2 town would call for the school meeting discussion in February and about a month later, voters would vote the budget up or down at the ballot box. A three-fifths majority of voter support is needed to approve the petition. In breaking news, Claremont police announced the arrest of two local men on charges related to heroin sale and possession. 43-year-old Eric Bastian of Alden Road is charged with two counts of heroin sale and one count of heroin possession with intent to sell. Each charge is punishable by up to seven years in prison. Also taken into custody today is Jeffrey Talbert, 49, of Enfield, New Hampshire. Talbert is charged with one count of heroin possession. Police carried out a search warrant this morning at 10.45 a.m. at Bastian's home. In that search, police found over $7,200 in cash and 20 grams of heroin with a street value of $4,000. Bastian is scheduled to be arraigned at 1 p.m. Wednesday in Claremont District Court on the charges. Bastian is being held without bail at the Sullivan County House of Correction in Unity, New Hampshire. Talbert was released on $5,000 personal recognizance. Talbert is scheduled to be arraigned on the charge in Claremont District Court on April 28th at 8.15 a.m. When YCN News returns, we'll hear from Upper Valley Chronicles and Holmes on the Hubert's department store in Claremont. The YCN News continues in a moment. Welcome back to YCN News. I'm Rose Spillman. Now let's join Upper Valley Chronicles and Holmes. Our guest right now is Chad Galusha. Chad is the manager here at the Huberts of Claremont. Chad, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Tell us about the Huberts in Claremont. How long have you guys been there? Um, coming up in April, we're going on uh, 24 years. So was that one of the original Huberts locations? The second one. The, second the first one, one was uh, in Newport. In Newport and still is in Newport. Yep. They're going uh, a little more than 40 years. Wow. And, um, and the Newport, is that, are they still in the same location where they started the business? I think it's directly across the street from where it originally started. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And still run by the Hubert family. It is, yes. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about your store. What are, people, what are people looking for? What do you have to offer in Claremont? Uh, we have all lines of sportwear. Um, sportswear from, from newborns up to men's workwear, uh, ladies sportswear, outerwear, things along that line. Mm -hmm. And you have, I know you have a ton of kids clothes. We do, yes. Yeah. And some of the brands, I know my son buys all his Carhartts there. Is that one of your bigger attractions for men? Uh, for men, the, the Carhartt's probably one of our biggest attractions. Mm -hmm. um, the work pants and work boots and things along that line. Mm -hmm. And is that, do people wear the Carhartt's just if they're like out in the field or are those sort of cross-purpose and they people wear them elsewhere too? They're pretty cross-purpose. I mean, they have a lot of lines that are just regular khakis that you can wear to an office, uh, to school, things along that line and also some really heavily insulated stuff that you can use for the winter months. Mm -hmm. For outdoor and... Yes. Yeah. And what about shoes? You guys, do you guys offer shoes? We do a lot of footwear, uh -huh. um, a lot of work boots. Uh, we have a pretty extensive line of, of Dansko clogs for women mm -hmm. that are good for, for working in hospitals and offices and things like that. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the trends that you see coming down the pike for spring and, and the warmer weather, if we ever get any warmer weather? What, do you do a lot of like sundresses or? We do a pretty good line of dresses. Uh -huh. um, a lot of lightweight fabrics, wicking materials, mm -hmm. um, and things along that line. And what have you seen, how's it changed so that people were wearing, you know, several years ago to now, what do you think the change in what people are looking for is? I think everything's become a lot lighter 
is really the lighter weight fabrics, um, so things flow a lot easier. And do you, are you one of the bigger stores, Chad? We're the second biggest. Uh -huh. Our Lebanon location is, is the biggest in size. Mm -hmm. And so w what happens if somebody comes into your store and you don't have the right size or the right color of something they want? Well, we have seven locations throughout the state, um, and we're always more than happy to call and get a different size or different color from one of the other stores. Mm -hmm. And how long does that take? Because, you know, people, I mean, nobody wants to wait, of course. Um, it can go anywhere from a couple of days to, to about a week at most. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And what are some of the other locations of the Hubert organization? We have uh, our Newport store, the Claremont store, of course, uh, New London, Woodsville, Goffstown, Peterborough, and Lebanon. And Goffstown is the new one? That's the newest one. They just opened up a um, little over a year ago. Mm -hmm. And do you think that they're going to continue to expand? I hope so. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had the we've had two new locations in the past couple of years, so it seems like they're kind of leaning towards that way. So it would be really exciting to see. Mm -hmm. And you're in Claremont. How long have you been with the Claremont store? I've been in Claremont for about three years, mm -hmm. and I've been with the company for going on about eight. Wow. And what is it about the Hubert's organization that keeps talented people like you? Um, it's I really like the the fact that it's it's family run. Um, you know, the Huberts play a big role in uh, daily operations with the stores. We talk to them all the time on the phone and, and get emails, and they're really great people to work for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Chad, tell us about some of the new technology in, in the fabrics and in the, you know, the outdoor, outdoor gear. Sure. Um, a lot of the fabrics, they're a lot lighter. <clears throat> like your typical winter coat that was very thick and bulky and, and tough to move in. Well, they've made all that material a lot lighter now, mm -hmm. so it still has the same warmth. It's just about a quarter of the size. And easier. And what about the, um, the outside, the, the Gore-Tex? Do you have all that? Yeah, we have a lot of, a lot of companies that carry the Gore-Tex, the waterproof membrane to them, mm -hmm. um, as well as different membranes that are waterproof made by different companies. Mm -hmm. And what was, what's your busiest season at Hubert's? Around the holiday time. So October, November, December, very busy months for us. Mm -hmm. And you have a website? We do. It's uh, hubert's.com. And you can go on there. Um, you can see all the companies that we carry. You can buy gift certificates on there. Unfortunately, at this time, we can't sell clothing items on there. Uh huh. But you could um, you could see what you have and then make a call to the store, go into the store, and. Yep, and all our phone phone numbers are listed online. Uh huh. And certainly, feel free to give us a call, and we'd be more than happy to find something for you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Chad, for being here today. And thank you. Check out Hubert's in Claremont and six other locations statewide. Thanks, Anne. When we return, I'll have your weather for the next five days and a look at some local high school sports. The YCN News continues in a moment. Welcome back to YCN News. I'm Rose Spillman. Tomorrow, we're expecting mixed precipitation with highs in the 30s and a low of 23 degrees. Thursday, we'll have a high of 41 degrees with lows in the 30s. Friday, we're expecting some rain, so you might want to bring a rain jacket when you go out. Highs will be in the 40s with a low of 24 degrees. Saturday will be partly cloudy with a high of 42 and lows in the 20s. Sunday, we're expecting more snow with highs in the upper 30s and lows down into the teens, so be sure to dress warm. If you're a fan of traditional Shakespeare, check out the production of Hamlet in Brattleboro at the Latches Theatre this Thursday. The show will start at 7 p.m., but will also be offered for free at 10.30 a.m. as part of the Winter Carnival. And now, let's look at some local high school basketball game results. There was a Kearsarge versus Raymond boys basketball game yesterday. Kearsarge was unable to top Raymond's score. The final score was 56 to 51. In girls basketball, the Kearsarge Cougars were lucky and defeated Raymond 40 to 24. In the Newport versus Sunapee battle, Sunapee was the team that was victorious. They won 63 to 32. Congratulations to our local teams. 
When YCN News continues, we'll hear from Capital Connections John O'Connor, who spoke with Sean LaFrance with the Foundation for Healthy Communities. The YCN News continues in a moment. Joining me is Sean LaFrance, who's the Executive Director of the Foundation for Healthy Communities. And Sean, I, I, I really got you here because I want to talk about mental health issues. I, I know you all did a, a really great report on that recently, um, but I'd, I'd like to sort of start with the history. You know, when I look at it, it looks to me like in the 60s, New Hampshire was really admired uh, for its mental health and its approach. And now it looks like we're mired. Um, so, Well, we, there has been a transformation in the sense that we went from a, the sort of traditional state hospital system where people were um, in large hospitals in New Hampshire Hospital at that. And when was that? Well, that was like in the 50s, and it started to change in the 60s. In the 60s. So, right. And, and, and we moved from this em emphasis almost of putting people in these large facilities, sometimes for their whole life. Institutionalized. Institutionalized, right to a focus on people being based, um, having services based in the communities where they live. And so as part of that system, and it was not unique to New Hampshire, I mean nationally there was a move to deinstitutionalization, de and people um, were provided services through community mental health centers. In New Hampshire, um, we had 10 community mental health centers, basically each county um, sort of serviced by a community mental health center. Although in the North Country, um, there's one large one that, that serves um, more than one county, actually. Um, and the, these have been great resources. And then people were put into, you know, into the hospital if they had acute illness that needed to be treated um, in a hospital setting, but people could actually um, live a, a life outside in the community and did not have to be locked away as people were for many so, decades. So how did we make that transition in the 60s and the 70s to this community mental health? Well, the framework, there's part of the framework really comes from the federal government so that this was not a, a change, if you will, that was unique to New Hampshire. But uh, New Hampshire, you know, was a part of this process. And, and you're correct in saying that um, we did um, have a reputation, if you will, of being one of the admired states in terms of our community mental health services and their ability to serve people in the community and uh, interface, if you will, with acute care psychiatric facilities when people needed that type of care. So what were we doing right that we were admired there? I mean... Well, we had a, I think we had a range of services available and, and um, as many things in New Hampshire, funding um, was provided um, at, a, at a point in time to support this adequately and there's been an erosion of funding um, in more recent years. And was that erosion recently, or or that erosion over time? It's over been a over time, but it's actually it's been um, more um, noticeable or acute in more recent years. Um, there have been a series of cutbacks, if you will, and I think it's a circumstance where you can cut a little here and a little there, but then pretty soon you're sort of you know cutting down to the bone, if you will, and so services. Um, are just not available um, as they once were. It, it, in addition to, I would say, in addition to the cutbacks in the services at the public sector level, it's it's also a factor that uh, traditionally in healthcare, mental health services have been a bit of a stepchild, if you will. It's sort of how they separate, you know, the head, our our teeth. Oral health is not part of physical health and such. So um, that has contributed, I, I would say, to the decline in services. Um, some people, for instance, um, insurance coverage for health care would treat mental health services differently, and that has led to some erosion, if you will, in the availability of services uh, because it's not necessarily covered by people's insurance. And was that going to change in, in the n new legislation nationally? or? Well, the, the law does call for parity um, between physical health and mental health services. So there is an emphasis on trying to establish um, the equality, if you will, between those two sectors of health care. Um, but, but it's also translating those kinds of policies into uh, an array of services that are accessible to people um, won't happen overnight. Um, it will require some investments. I mean, we have major 
issues in terms of just staffing, so the a lack of, if you will, um, psychiatric care or psychiatrists, particularly in the area of children and adolescents. Um, that's uh, a major problem here in New Hampshire, but also not, again, unique to New Hampshire. It's, it's part of a larger and national is, problem. Is this insurance, it, is that, that's not going to be the solution for that, the, these issues? Right. Insurance coverage for people will not deal with workforce shortage issues, for instance. Um, and, and certainly not in the short run. Correct. It will take time. I mean, we. I think some of these problems um, have developed over a period of time, and I'm not sure that they will be remedied quickly. Um, there'll need to be some investments um, to restore services that were once available. Well, I guess, I mean, that's really the subject of your report, and we're just out of time with this. Thank you for joining us for this Tuesday edition of YCN News. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And you can watch our programs anytime online at www.ycnnow.com. Be sure to tune in tomorrow to hear from Gladys Smith, a Woodcrest Village resident. I'm Rose Spillman for YCN, your local view. Good night.